Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Most HTTP APIs or services are stateless, meaning that they have to query a database or cache to get state and make another query to the database to write state. And this has to happen for every HTTP request. So why is it common to create stateless applications? Because creating stateful applications can be difficult, especially when you're horizontally scaling. But it doesn't have to be. I'll explain how you can use cloud native objects to create stateful applications that can help scale and performance. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So let's start off with the simplest example of a stateless web application or HTTP API. So we have our clients or browsers that are going to make a request to our application to perform some state change on an entity or some business process. So what that usually looks like is they make the request to our app service. Our app service then has to go and query the database or cache to get state so that they can determine if all the business rules or validation passes to make sure that we're in a good state to even perform our state change. If all that's successful, then we can then go and write our insert or update whatever statement to do that state change on our database. Subsequently, every other request kind of goes through that same type of life cycle where no state is actually on the app service. We have to go to the database or cache to get it. So to turn this into a stateful application, let's start with our clients are still hitting our app service and we have no state yet. So we query our database. We get our state back. But what we're doing now is we're persisting this in memory on the app service for whatever, again, entity or object that we're working with. So as we do normally, we perform our business logic validation against that state and we determine, yes, okay, it passes so we can make our state change. But in memory, this little object here, that is up to date, that is current state. So that means that a subsequent request for that same type of uh, entity or object that we have in memory we don't have to query our database anymore. We have it directly. So we can just directly perform our validation or business rules. And if they pass, then we can go and make our write statement. So we've eliminated having to do that initial read to get state because we already have it in memory directly in our app service. So this becomes much more difficult when we start scaling horizontally our app service. So what I've done here to illustrate this is we have our load balancer and I have three different instances of our app service. So if a first request comes in, and we're just doing round robin here for our load balancer, if the first request comes in and we hit the first app service, it goes into the database, gets the state, and again, keeps it in memory. But if another request comes in and hits the second app service, we do the exact same thing. Here's the problem in that both instances now have a copy of what that entity or object is. And if our second instance here made a state change to the database, now the first one, has a stale out of date version. So really what we want here is we want our app services to only have one place with a single point of truth where any one object exists in memory. And we're doing this because we are just trying to limit the number of requests we're making to our database. As you can see here, our database ultimately becomes the bottleneck. So we wanna limit the number of queries that we have to perform on it. And we can do that creating stateful applications. But how do we solve this issue where each different app service is kind of working independently. We need them to communicate in order to know where a particular uh, object is in memory so that we don't have to go hit the database. So how do we do that? You can accomplish this using cloud native objects. I'm going to use Microsoft Orleans, which has the concept of virtual actors, which are known as grains. But Ruben Bond, who's on the Microsoft Orleans team, often calls them cloud native objects, which I think is a really good term. So I'm going to steal that and call them cloud native objects. So to illustrate how Orleans works, it has a few different building blocks, two of which I'm illustrating here, which are cloud native objects. And again, Orleans calls these grains, live in silos. And you can create a cluster of silos. So to illustrate this, I have this app service and we're moving it from having that state in memory rather than those objects living in a silo somewhere. So I'm illustrating here just kind of separation, but the way this can really work as well is you could turn your app service to also co-host a silo. And what this means is I, now you see that I have different arrows here where our silos are communicating with each other. So if you have a request that hits a particular, say, let's say the first app service and you need to talk with a cloud native object, you'll see with the programming model, you don't really know where it lives. 
But that actual um, object that you're working with could live in any app service, in, in any silo in an app service. So you'll see the programming model here in a second. But this allows us to uh, have state within our, uh, our app services distributed across them in a, a cluster of silos. I want to say thank you to all the members of my YouTube and Patreon. I really do appreciate the support. They'll get access to all the source code I'm about to show, as well as a private Discord server. If you want more information on joining, check out the links in the description. So while this isn't a full-blown Orleans tutorial, I am going to explain how it works and how you implement some of this. So the first thing I need to do is to define an interface that's going to expose all the behavior we want for our cloud native object. And again, Orleans calls this a grain. So I have this I invoice number generator grain, and I am using the I grain with GUID key. Now the purpose of this, uh, and this is from Orleans, this I grain with GUID key, is because you need to identify a grain so that you can retrieve it. This could be done with a GUID, an int, a string, some type of identifier. And I'm defining on this interface uh, all the methods that we want to expose. So I'm calling the reserve invoice number. So for our implementation here, I'm extending grain. I'm implementing the invoice or the interface that we're creating. And why I'm using this example is I'm creating, I'm generating invoice numbers um, sequentially, and that's because all operations done in a grain are single threaded. There's no concurrency that we have to worry about. So the method that I've implemented here, our reserve invoice number, we're just using a logger to output some data that you can see later in the console. And I'm incrementing our invoice number and returning it. So I'm keeping this example simple. I'm not using any persistence. Orleans has a different way to do persistence. This is all done when an object is activated from a silo and it's all kind of done behind the scenes for you. One of the ways here is there's an override for on activate async. You could do work there to go fetch out the initial state from the database. But at that point, once you actually have that state within your object, it's in memory and it lives there. So the next thing to show is how to create a silo. And I'm going to show you two different ways. The first is just a standalone console app that I'm using a host builder here and calling use Orleans to specify that I'm just doing local host clustering, um, in memory grain storage, and just run. And this is really the entirety of it. And this project is referencing my domain project though. However, because it needs to know where the grains are and what the implementation is. The second way to do this is, as I mentioned in some of the slides, is that you can host this alongside ASP.NET Core. So here I'm creating a builder again. I'm using Orleans and I'm also configuring ASP.NET Core with our web host defaults and doing the same types of things that you would expect. So I still have, for example, my startup that I'm using. I'm configuring ASP.NET Core, but I'm also hosting a silo alongside that uh, in our ASP.NET Core project. So there's two different ways that you can do that. So the last piece of the puzzle is how we actually interact and evoke methods on our cloud native of object, our grain. So to do that, I have a route here that I'm injecting the iCluster client, and I'm also taking the uh, GUID of the tenant ID in our route. So what I can do is use that cluster client called get grain. And the type parameter here is going to be the interface that we've defined of our invoice number generator. That's what we're always working with as an interface. And then as I showed earlier, we have to identify it in some way. So I'm using that GUID that I'm going to be passing in from the route. So once I have our interface, we have our grain out, I can call any method on it. This feels like a local object. You're not really realizing where that object came from, where it's executing. So I'm just going to call it, call await, and return that value from our HTTP API. So to test this out, what I've done is I've created a console application where I'm going to send 10 parallel requests to the route that we've defined for a particular unique uh, cloud native object, Green. So you can see here I'm using parallel for each async, and I'm going to make a request based off the tenant that we're passing into it. And I'm just doing the console write line. It's basically passing everything all the way through from our HTTP API so that we can see where it's running at. And to do that, I'm actually going to create a cluster of two silos so that you can see that some grains will live on one silo, some will live on another, but I'm only hosting one HTTP API. All right, so I have everything running at the very top, the top left and the top right are two instances of the silo project that I illustrated. So it's the ones that are going to be executing our cloud native objects, our grains. On the bottom right is our HTTP API, and this is what was invoking our grains. And on the bottom left is our client, which is making the HTTP request to our HTTP API. So what you're going to notice is logging in a couple different places. When I run the client, it was outputting the invoice numbers that were being generated. But as well as you're going to see, because I had it in my grain, my cloud native object was logging as well, 
you're going to see that happen in one of the silos because that's where it's actually executing. So I'm going to specify tenant one. And we can see that it executed in the, the silo here on the top left. This is what we're printing out. This was our tenant ID and then our invoice number. And you can see everything was happening uh, sequentially, uh, single threaded. So here's our output. We didn't duplicate any numbers. Nothing was happening concurrently. But because I was doing this in parallel, the output's going to be a little bit uh, off here because we were doing it all with uh, parallel for each async. So if I do tenant one again, it will again, it will execute in this same silo because that's where that particular object lives. So let's run it again. And we can see it ran over here where it should be. And we get our sequential uh, invoice numbers with no duplicates. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run this multiple times to try to hit the second silo. Because again, as you see in the code, you're not really specifying where they're actually going to be executing live at. So let's just run this multiple times here. So I'm going to do two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there we go. I did a bunch of them, nine, and I've executed now on the second silo. So here it is. Um, here's our invoice numbers. I'm going to do nine again, and we can see that it's going to run on the second silo again. And again, it ran there and we're getting our numbers again with no duplicates again, because we're single threaded. So why would you want to use cloud native objects? Kind of what I illustrated. The first is it offloads a lot of work from your database where you don't have to go to the database all the time to get state so that you can apply some type of business logic or validation rules. So you're offloading a lot of work there. The second is because cloud native objects are generally single threaded, if you have that need, that can be really, really beneficial. An example of this most commonly uh, that applies to the two that I'm talking about are aggregates. Oftentimes you want an aggregate route to perform uh, functions in a single threaded manner, as well as it needs all the data to apply uh, its invariance in business logic because it is a consistency boundary. So the key thing there is that you get the benefit of being single threaded and you get the benefit of being in memory. So you only have to pay the cost when you need to build up that cloud native object. You can hit the database, get all that data that then you're using uh, to apply your variance and business logic. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.